So hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for this last session in the three-part series from Temple Road of Shalom, Unheard Histories, Understanding Racism in Our Communities. In September, we learned about Arlington, last month, Falls Church, and tonight we're here to focus on Fairfax County. We'll learn about some of the neighborhoods in the county, about their racial dynamics and how those came to be. We'll hear stories that will help us understand more about the experiences of people of color in Fairfax County. And then we'll learn about what is being done and what we can do to address systemic racism here. At every one of these sessions, there are so many takeaways on so many levels, educational, inspirational, and emotional, and sometimes outrage. And there are aha moments. Last month, this happened to me when I learned about the boundaries of the city of Falls Church. I had always passively wondered how the small wealthy city came to be this island of itself. I felt disbelief when I learned that the reason for significant parts of the limited boundaries of the city was that its white leaders deliberately acted to shut out black residents from living within the city's lines and therefore voting for local representation. In other words, it was racially gerrymandered. It surprised me, and yet it made sense. I am learning so much from this series, and I know that all of you are too. This was one of, the few, of, of a few major projects that came out of our congregation's work to lean into the national conversation about racism that began in May of 2020 and hold ourselves accountable for understanding what we can and doing what we can about racism in our communities. I am incredibly grateful to so many of our lay leaders, and especially tonight to the leaders who've created the Unheard Stories series. I'm gonna turn this over now to one of those people, Julie Rosenberg. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, Rabbi Sachs. Um, we really appreciate your support and the welcome. Um, so as Rabbi Sachs, said, this is our, our final um, webinar in this series in which we are looking at the existing systems and the policies that are locking in racism in our communities. Our team from Temple Road of Shalom created this program because we wanted to learn more about the role of race and racism that shapes our neighborhoods because we want to work actively to break up these longstanding and deeply rooted racial inequities where we live. So, so far we've learned from experts and advocates about land use and housing and school policies in Arlington, as Rabbi Sachs mentioned last month was on Fairfax City and tonight we're gonna to focus on Fairfax County. Um, so if we can get the agenda here, just a quick overview. Um, we have fantastic presenters who've been incredibly generous with their time. We also have a custom made video and um, Alicia Jones McLeod from uh, Challenging Racism, Racism is gonna bring it home for us with her you know, call to action and, and uh, she's also gonna curate the Q and A. Um, we hope you have had a chance to look at the prep materials in advance um, and it includes this agenda. Um, afterwards, we'll follow up with um, follow up materials and, and any top any content that has come up through the discussion. Um, uh, folks have asked about recordings. Um, this session is being recorded through Zoom. The audience members will not be identified in the recording. We will email all of you a link to this recording and the whole suite of recordings when we have them all um, together. Um, now, the way you participate um, is this is a webinar, so you will you will you will interact with us only through the Q and A. You'll send questions and comments through the Q and A. We will then um, we have a team of folks who are looking through the, the questions and the comments, and they'll get them to uh, the panel for the end of the session. We'll have a few of them. Uh, you know, we'll be able to discuss a few a few of the questions, and. Um, so I, I think it's time to get started with our program. So I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. George Oberly, who is a librarian at George Mason University. And again, as, as uh, Dr. Oberly is talking, please be sure you send your, your, feel free to send questions and comments through the chat. Thank you. Dr. Oberly, you wanna go ahead? Thank you so much, Julie. I'm, I'm so grateful to have been invited 
to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing at George Mason University. Um, so, um, I, and I'm grateful for the work that you are doing to better understand the history of race in our communities. Um, so I have a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions at the end of this. Um, and so I, I, my name is George Overly. I, uh, I have a PhD in history. Um, I have a joint appointment in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason, um, as well as in the university libraries. And I'm the director of the Center for Mason Legacies, where we try to find hidden histories and we explore those, especially in our local communities. We've greatly benefited from lots of the um, resources available from places like Fairfax County Public Libraries, from Jeff Clark, who you're going to hear from a little later, from the Fairfax County Historic Records Center um, in the Circuit Court, um, and a lot of really good local history that's going on um, here um, in, in our region. Um, so, pardon me. There we go. So let me just tell you um, how I got invited to this. Um, and, um, and basically, um, my, my colleagues and I in the Center for Mason Legacies, we started a project in the summer last summer um, called Black Lives Next Door. And this project is, of, it's very much an ongoing and it was an interdisciplinary project that was a collaboration between my, my dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Lenitra Berger and Dr. Benedict Carton, um, where we led a summer research team of six undergraduate students and two doctoral candidates with the goal of studying the hidden histories related to who were the black lives or, or how did George Mason University um, and the college at the time, because that was the predecessor. Um, in what ways did they engage with the Black community um, as they were a, a developing institution? Um, and the team asked a series of questions, specifically how did segregation affect George Mason College and the surrounding communities and the public schools? Were all citizens welcome to learn and teach at our new college um, in Fairfax? What extent did civil rights movements mobilize uh, students and the faculty and their neighbors? And fundamentally, we wanted to know is, was anti-racist activism a part of campus life and part of the community? We were very much inspired by Richard Rothstein. So I've, I've watched some of the videos of the earlier sessions. I know you all have been, been engaging with his very important book, uh, The Color of Law. Um, we actually were inspired by his op-ed in the New York Times actually called Black Lives Next Door, where he called for a, a movement to, to kind of better understand um, how racism was um, taking place in local communities because he felt that the abusive practices um, and racial inequities um, that were allowed to occur were prevalent there and really not focused upon before. So to find out more about our work, you can go to our site, but I'm gonna highlight a few broad ideas. To, under to, to understand this, we really needed to know more about the history of George, oh, I'm sorry, of Fairfax County in general. And what we found as scholars, because this is what we do, we try to look to see if other scholars have, have worked on this. And we didn't find a lot of so-called scholarly literature out there, um, but we did find a lot of work being done. Um, and one thing that was really um, clear from the work that had been done um, in places like Alexandria, uh, by Kristen Moon, who's uh, the, the title page of her article um, was very helpful to us um, in where she explored the uh, African-American housing crisis in the period of 1930s to the 1960s. And then Russ Bannum's uh, work, which isn't really super scholarly, but it's, it's a good ex explanation of the growth of, um, of development in Fairfax County. 
And what was interesting when we started to explore all of the literature that was being done is that it was really different than what Rothstein found in his Color of Law. Um, and in fact, it's a bit more complicated and more subtle to be able to explore that, um, to explore this. So one thing I started with, or we started with, was to try to understand the, um, the demographic story. And in this chart, I think it's a really telling um, um, visualization because it shows the Fairfax County population percentage by race over time. And specifically, what I really just key in on and where I would like you to kind of notice is please note the steady decline from around 1880 to 1930 um, in terms of the black population, but then in particular from around 1930 to 1970, there's this precipitous decline in the percentage of black population in Fairfax County um, um, till uh, eventually in 1970, uh, the 1970 census, uh, the population is at around 3%. This is also a really interesting, uh, that, last, um, that last slide only told a small part of the story. This is actually a really important part of the story, I think, because in this, it shows a relatively stable community in terms of numbers in Fairfax County. There aren't a lot of people in Fairfax County until you get into the 1940s and 50s. And notice the incredible increase in the white population that occurs in this period. And this is where all of the suburban growth begins in this period. It, it's quite dramatic. I would also point out, you don't have a major decline in African-Americans in the total number in the end, but you do have um, of them being dwarfed by the influx of new um, white uh, population. So what is this all kind of telling us? In a way, this fits into a bigger story about suburbanization. And in many ways, after 1945, um, what some scholars have kind of pointed out is that there was a culture of clearance that, that existed here, um, uh, spe specifically in Fairfax County. And the bulldozer became this kind of symbol of destructive progress. And in the place of the rural environment, middle-class suburbs emerged on the raised ground. Um, and within that period, there was not only the removal of earth, the removal of memory that also existed. One of the things that I think is very telling is to look at these aerial photographs. This is avail available from Fairfax County's GIS unit. There are other collections that have these kinds of things. And this is around the, the George Mason area. Um, in fact, up here, this is the southern border of Fairfax City. And one thing you can kind of see is that it's very rural in 1953. But by 1972, you already have patterns of track developments. Um, and this only increases um, over time. But by the periods that we were studying, the pattern had already been developed in this. Um, I will point out that, um, that uh, this made Fairfax a site for white prosperity and black displacement. By 1940s, longstanding long standing African-American communities were being pushed out of the county. And this was documented in a report in 1970 by the Washington Suburban Institute, which found that systematic racism was at fault because of low, the, for the low income black people who were being excluded from housing and jobs in the regions. Local politicians, for the most part, ignored this conclusion and chose to downplay the histories of this inequity, spurring the growth of townhomes and single family homes, which I know you've, you've heard about in previous sessions. Um, and what was really important to the leaders at that time was the ubiquitous subdivision. It was the welcoming white professionals with mortgages, who worked for the federal governments and area corporations who were contracted to help America win the Cold War. 
Now, this is a pretty great image. I believe this is Jeff Clark's image that kind of identifies some of the many African-American communities that um, were in Fairfax County. I can't speak to all of them at this point in time, but um, what is really striking to me is the sheer number. And we're gonna have some other folks talking about Gum Springs. In fact, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Gum Springs in a bit, but there are just, a large number of communities that I was unaware of before I started working with these students on this project. Um, so it's, it's quite stunning. Now, I did want to say we started with the idea of trying to look for examples of um, issues of racial covenants, much like what um, um, Richard Rothstein discusses. Um, and we did find a few, thanks to our friends in the Fairfax County Courthouse Archive. Here is one example up in McLean from 1949, um, where you can kind of see uh, the, the kind of limitations that are articulated in this document. And here is the graphic of where this actually occurred in this tract. Um, and this is another example that we found. This one is in Colchester, uh, the Colchester community. And this one, um, that's over on Mason Neck. And you'll notice the crossed out um, portion, which excluded um, any African-Americans from living in, a, in one of these uh, dwellings, unless they were a domestic servant. Um, and uh, then I guess it was allowed. Um, they wanted to make sure they, created that caveat. But what was really interesting or challenging is that Fairfax County didn't seem to have as many of the racial covenants um, from the neighborhoods that we could find. And we believe that's because the neighborhoods developed a little later than where, what they developed in places like Alexandria. Um, and so as a result, there was a different approach to um, engaging with the African-American community. And the one that we really honed in on was this um, experience with the Fairfax County Public Health Unit, specific, uh, sorry, specifically the Division of Environmental Health. And in this, this, this kind of um, environment, uh, what we found, and it was really surprising, this kind of, the, the Board of Supervisors sought to encourage the growth of suburban community and its tax base. And they wondered if they could use the example that, that was used up in Alexandria's housing authority to, quote, eliminate unsanitary conditions, unquote, and if that could provide a model that could be emulated. So in the early 1960s, the Fairfax County Public Health Department started to enforce newly passed housing hygiene codes. These ordinances gave broad powers for the Public Health Department and its 17 sanitarians, which is quite a lot, 17 sanitarians. Um, and the powers could actually condemn houses um, and this, this whole experience was well covered by newspapers. Um, the Washington Post, I have a clipping here, um, called it under the headline, Fairfax Unit Cracks Down. Um, and the article kind of chronicles the demolition of, of many dwellings that were deemed unfit for human habitation. And this was led by Dr. Um, Harold Kennedy, who reported the destruction of some 700 in this paper, of some 767 separate locations. And the quote you can read for yourself of some 559 involved white families and 208 were African-Americans. This, the Fairfax African-American community of Gum Springs in particular was cited in the press as a place of quote, crowded shacks, poor or non-existent drainage and sewage unquote, which if leveled could create environmental problems and social unrest. So between 1963 and 66, Dr. Kennedy's focused interventions in impoverished black areas led to a crisis of homelessness. 
And worried about this dire situation, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors passed an emergency amendment providing an automatic review of removal orders issued by the health department. And the measure read kind of like a stay of execution in some ways. So some examples of, of how the county knew what was going on. Uh, we recently found this 1963 report, which looked at um, issues related to housing situations in Fairfax. And some of the findings that which were quite extensive um, um, was particularly um, problematic for middle-class African-Americans, especially teachers and other professionals who were finding it more difficult to be able to afford to live in a place near the places where they worked. Um, does that sound familiar like to today, actually? Um, this, and they, they actually argued that this situation deprived the local community of leadership. And they worried about this, this, this group that submitted the report. They did say that approximately half the faculty in the African-American schools had to commute about 40 miles daily, sometimes twice daily, um, from places like the DC and others. The uh, report also found that the largest concentration of what they would co they called substandard housing in the county was in Gum Springs, where approximately uh, 1,600 people were in some 270 houses, and 60% were dilapidated. And that was an official term that was defined in this report. Um, they, they had qualitative kinds of terms that defined all of these components. Um, and as you can see here, that the, the, the concentration of these um, substandard housing in Northern Virginia were kind of focused on Gum Springs, where this was a heavily African American community. What this led to, um, which I know that you have uh, you've you've heard about before. Um, is a series of protests and one that I want to focus on um, that we, we kind of did some work on was the Access March of 1966. Access is the Action Coordinating Committee to End Segregation in the Suburbs. And this was founded by J. Charles Jones in June of 1966, who I'm pretty sure you mentioned in the earlier session. The group observed, and Jones in particular, observed that the racial composition of the suburbs surrounding DC, um, Jones described it as a, quote, white ghetto surrounded, surrounding the black ghettos. And he wanted to integrate both ghettos and secure affordable housing for the residents. And Jones knew that he had to mobilize a, a, a large group of different people to accomplish the goals. So he organized a major protest to cover some 65 miles around the Capitol Beltway with the aim to bring attention to the patterns of segregated housing. These demonstrators started their walk on 8 June, 1966, and they, pre they proceeded for four days um, alongside the multi-lane traffic and they, um, they went about 15 to 20 miles a day during um, daylight hours. While that was happening, they encountered some adversaries who shouted obscenities and, and embraced uh, supporters who actually delivered food baskets and drinks to help uh, quench the summer thirsts. This is another image, and I actually really love this particular image. It reminds me of Ayas on the prize. Um, and in particular, um, also the, the, the length of this, um, of this march is really critical. And the reason that we think that this is so important is it demonstrates that this is a community issue, that we can't just look at this on a county by county or municipality by mis municipality basis, we have to look at the broader region, which is why I'm so grateful that y'all have been looking at this uh, broader set of questions. I do want to point out um, that there are great resources available to you. Uh, you can see the research guides um, created by the Fairfax County Public Library as, and the Fairfax County Historic Records Center. 
I also would like to encourage you to explore um, our Black Lives Next Door site, where we have a number of many different stories. I won't go into all of them right now. I hope you'll explore them at your own leisure. But we, we kind of use different cases to understand um, not just George Mason's environment, but the community and the various ways in which the Black community either resisted or challenged some of these uh, systems of racism, um, including Rest in Black Focus, which is an important um, answer to the planned community, um, which was mostly white uh, folks, as well as some of our other kind of um, stories about Eleven Oaks and some of the other schools in the region, including, including Fairfax at a Rosenwald School. I don't know if you know that, um, which my, my dear friend Lenitra Berger is doing a big project on right now. So I'm going to end my part of the um, presentation here. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm really looking forward to any feedback or any questions you may have um, in the in the later section. Thank great. you. Thank, thank you so much, George. And this is a great segue to our storytelling segment. Um, and that for storytelling, we actually have um, Ron Chase, who uh, is the director of the Gum Springs Historical Society. So that was a perfect um, lead into to Ron Chase, and then uh, Phyllis Walker Ford, who is the president of the, um, the Laurel Grove School Association. And the, we, we've ha we have um, uh, Jeff Clark, who is the head of AV for the uh, Fairfax County Public Schools, has very kindly created a video specifically for this program. Um, and then after we see his video, the video that he put together, we'll go into the discussion with uh, Mr. Chase and Ms. Walker Ford. So turn it over to you all. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're gonna start tonight with a video for the storytelling section. This is about 10 minutes long. You're gonna see snippets of three separate videos in this. The first one is part of a video called The Quilt Project that was done in the 1990s. The second one is a video that I taped uh, about the history of the Merrifield area and growing up in school there and then the bus ride to Manassas, you'll hear about that. The third one is dealing with school desegregation. So I'm gonna play that for you now. Fairfax County, Virginia is rich in history. When we think of the county and the people who lived here, we often think of George Washington, George Mason, Clara Barton, and the family of Robert E. Lee, whose land holdings and contributions to the county and the nation have been recognized and documented. In contrast, the role of African Americans in Fairfax County mainly has been overlooked, unchronicled, and forgotten. Have you ever heard of Frederick Foote, John Bell, or Mary Stewart? Well, these individuals were also notable figures in Fairfax County history. Part of the reason for their omission from history books is that the record of African-American contributions is mostly oral. The majority of black people were denied educational opportunities equaling those of whites until the 1960s. As a result, the African-American experience of living and growing together, sharing life's sorrows and celebrations as a community has been passed down verbally from generation to generation. To recognize this oral tradition and preserve African-American history in Fairfax County, BUFA, the Black Women United for Action, created a quilt. As an organization dedicated to educating the total community about contributions and needs of the county's black population, BUFA saw the quilt as a tangible reminder of African-American involvement in the growth and development of Fairfax County. The quilt depicts scenes of educational, religious, family, and social life in African-American communities. These communities include parts of Chantilly and Herndon, Vienna, Falls Church, Audrick's Corner, Bailey's Crossroads, and the area surrounding Gum Springs. In each community, people had a story to tell, a story of contribution and achievement. I don't know when the school was formed, but it's just a one-room school, and all the kids from here, we call this area the Pines. All the kids from the Pines, all the kids on Lee Highway, 
uh, it, it wasn't a whole lot because it was a lot of farmland. But uh, they went to that one-room school. What we got when I went to school were leftover books from the white children. And the pages might be missing, but we had to pay for them. We had to pay for the books. They didn't give us anything. We had to pay for those books. And it wasn't easy because, you know, here's a bunch of uh, farmers, sharecroppers, people that don't make a whole lot of money. But when I was going to school, that school didn't have anything in it but the desks <laughs> and uh, whatever the teacher would bring for us to work with. And when I got older, I recognized the fact that we didn't have the facilities that other children have. We would see the kids riding, white kids riding uh, school bus. They were going to brick schools. We were in that same school with outhouses. They had indoor plumbing. We were outhouses. And they used to throw things off the bus at us as we were walking. Mr. Tobin would, he had a Model T, a Model A car. And we'd be walking to school, and if the Gallows Road was this big with deep ruts and <laughs> gullies or whatever, you know, it wasn't paved like this. It was catamized, they call it a little bit of gravel and a little bit of tar. So the, we would be walking, and there's no dividing lines in there, you know. One car almost had to stop to get past Gallows Road was. And uh, he would be trying to run us off the road. We'd walk it over from school. He'd do it all the time. That we told our grandfather about him doing that, and it was going on so often. He went, came by over here because he lived behind me. Uh, he came over here and uh, told, talked to him. He said, you can't be doing my grandchildren like that. And I guess he thought by my grandfather being a soldier, he would do something to him. But my grandfather wouldn't. He, he was too tame. <laughs> And if I didn't get that elementary education, <laughs> I don't know what I would have done because high school was not meant for us, you know. They didn't have a high school. These children were sent, uh, if they could afford it, because you had to pay a tuition to, to go to D.C. So the school board made a contract with the, uh, Prince William County to send these kids to Manassas. But it was a trip. We have to get up four thirty in the morning, get this stuff ready, walk from here to Lee Highway to catch this bus that's gonna pick up children in Fall Church. And the bus would pick us up. It would turn uh right there at Gallo, going to pick up the Dunloin kids. And we go from there to McLean, pick up kids and go to Vienna. From Vienna we would go <laughs> we would go to Centerville, and you go all the way down to 234 to go before we could get to the school. Manassas Industrial High School, where Jenny Dean started. I was born in Falls Church, Virginia, so, and I graduated from uh, James Lee Elementary School in the seventh grade. That was as far as I could go in Fairfax County. So uh, I was bused up, up there to Manassas each day for two years. The bus picked us up around 7 or 7.30. And it was a Riley bus, 99 <laughs> times every week we'd be sitting on the highway waiting for someone to come and get us. We, we carried our lunch. We carried our lunch. We ate it before we got to school because we'd be so hungry. <laughs> and when lunchtime come, we would go to the cafeteria and the teacher would be so, feel sorry for us. And she would give us a sandwich or soup or something to last up. But we had time, uh, you know, 27 miles one way, we had time to get to the, talk to each other and coming back, we could sleep, and we were tired, whatever, but it was, it was an experience. So Fairfax County were being pressured by the tenors and all in Maryfield, all through the county, to build something. So this is when Luther Jackson was uh, first born, well, in 54. Janice Winters, do you know of her? She was the teacher on staff, and she and I both integrated the school. And I integrated it because my kids were going to go there. And I remember it was the first kindergarten in Fairfax County. 
And we were unpacking these puzzle tangible pieces. And I was putting that on the floor. And I looked and I'm like, oh no. Oh no, to the no. What happened? All the professionals, the doctor, the nurses, the women, they were white. And all the black ones were the janitors. All the, it was pretty obvious. And I'm like, nah. And I'd say I was pretty militant. Well, anyway, that didn't happen the following year. Yeah. But I do remember fighting for, um, I can close my eyes and see those students today. Well, I mean, see them back then. I would walk up the, I would go out for something in math and reading time. And the little black boys were sitting outside the door. Why are you sitting here? And they were little baby boys. Why? And then, then I started in. Oh, well, so and so, sir, I, I would investigate and teach, disrupting my class, you know, saying all that. Little black boys. Oh, none of the white kids, but all little black boys. Up and down the halls. And so the new principal and I had, uh, I had to be put in my place more than one time. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay because I was growing, but learning how to deal with. I remember once that this principal and the office staff had a little black boy taken out of his reading class to come draw pictures for. You had to send home weekly bulletins, okay. and he was sitting in the office drawing. He was a gifted drawer. Sure. Uh, uh, and his parents, most of the parents of the black children were not ones who could fight. Mm. They were farm hands or they were different, you know, they didn't, they didn't. And so it all, a lot laid on me. And I remember one time a faculty member uh, said to me, not necessarily the lady I'm just speaking of, but another one who had just joined us said to me, why are you always starting stuff? I get along with these white people. Why don't you stop it? I'm like, here we go again. But that was my intro, and that was my role. I looked back and said, I did. And I, and I know some good things came out of that. Mm -hmm. That little boy is in prison that drew those cars. All of those mm -hmm. kids, they were beautifully raised children with no, you know, no hope, no motivation. No. Mm -hmm. So uh, that several of those boys, particularly that one, that uh, I took a like it too, to try to help, and he ended up in prison. Mm. But what hope? But that was the downfall of, of going, transitioning without, without the support. All three of those videos are available in their full length form on the Fairfax County Public Schools YouTube channel. We'll send you a link to that later. So I'd like to get into our discussion now with um, Phyllis Walker Ford and Ron Chase. Phyllis, I'm gonna start with you. Um, and I have uh, some slides I'll show Phil, so you might need to walk me through them, but we were talking together about your family and where you grew up. Can you tell us a little bit about um, where you were born and uh, what it was like growing up in Fairfax County? Okay, thank you. I was born in Washington, D.C. because at the time I was born, it was very segregated in Fairfax County and there was no hospital in around our area. The closest hospital was in the city of Alexandria, but African-Americans couldn't go there because it was for white families only. So I was born in, in a private hospital in Washington, D.C. But my parents built the home that they um, lived in. That home was built in 1942 in the Franconia community. And Franconia was a community that was started in 1870. And it was actually started after my great grandfather had purchased 13 acres of land in that same area. Uh, so that, that 13 acres was passed down to generations in my family. And my father and his siblings all had houses built on that original 13 acres. My neighborhood consisted of, um, on one side of Beulah Road, my neighborhood was my, my parents, my family, uh, my father's siblings and their spouses. Each of them had a house on the property. Across the street from us was a white family named the Gorham family. And they were very similar to us. 
they had, there were three brothers who had built houses next door to each other. And so those growing up, those Gorm children were the children that, children that my brother and I uh, actually played with and associated with in our little uh, small neighborhood. And it was interesting to see that on both sides of the road, we pretty much had the same things. The Gorm family uh, had their houses. Their houses were near the church, a church, uh, which was uh, Bueller Baptist Church. And then on my side, my family had our property. And then we had, had next door to us was the Wall Grove Baptist Church. And that, that church was built in, in the 1800s. So when you look at uh, what has been talked about early in the program this evening, we, we talked about areas uh, starting pretty much around the 1940s. But in, our, in the area of Franconia, there were uh, enslaved people about two miles from where my uh, great grandfather actually ended up buying the property. So if he was there, uh, he would have been there in the uh, 18, he was freed in 1842. So he didn't go very far. He went less than two miles to purchase the property from where he was, was enslaved at. Um, so in, the, in our area, we continue to, uh, to live there and uh, mingle with the, the people in the community. Closer to us, about two miles away from us was a community called Carrolltown which was a black community of about uh, 10 families. That uh, area is now today called Kingstown. Um, with, with my family, where we, where we lived, it was still a rural area. So we had our vegetable garden, we had a, um, a cow, a horse, uh, and uh, we grew our own. Uh, vegetables and also uh, our my dad was able to uh, provide the, the beef and the pork from and chi and there were chickens that we had also there. Um, so I think I think part part of our story also includes the fact that. I didn't get to associate with the African Americans in the community until we actually went to church on, on Sunday. So most of what our, uh, my brother and I were, um, our activities in terms of growing up and, and dealing with other children or the other children were the, the white children of the, of the Gorham family. Um, so for, for us, um, we had, cousins that we always uh, were around. And my mother's family was large families because she was one of 12. So we had family members that lived in DC, Maryland and Virginia, and we could go back and forth and, and visit with them. Can you tell us about the Laurel Grove School and the, and the museum there and your role in all that? Is, that? is that all that's kind of left of that community you grew up in? Yes. Uh, I'll bring up their, I'll bring up their have, slides while you talk. I have some slides for, for the Law Grove School. The, the Law Grove School was established actually in 1881. And the reason it was established was because those African-American families that I said lived in Carrolltown and uh, on, on my side, there was no school for those students in the area to go to. Uh, so, uh, William Jasper and his wife Georgiana deeded a half acre of land to the Mount Vernon School District to build that school. Uh, the county was not, um, public education in Virginia started in 1870. So, it, for African American students, the county was not providing the school for teachers. Uh, so the families in the community got together and built the um, Ball Grove School. Uh, the land was deeded in 1881. It's, it's believed that the students started coming around 1883 to the school. 
It was first through seventh grade. Uh, do you want me to go through? I don't know how much time we probably got two more minutes for you, Phyllis, before we have to go to Mr. Chase. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about your family connection to the school. Are, aren't you a descendant of William Jasper, if I remember correctly? I'm the great great granddaughter of William Jasper, yes. And I'm sorry. And, and they, uh, the photo you see here are, are my grandparents. Um, this is actually the, the lady in the, in the photo is actually uh, the daughter of William and Georgiana Jasper. Her name is, is Georgiana also. Uh, she married Maurice Jenkins Walker. And Maurice's job uh, was he was the janitor at the white uh, Franconia Elementary School in, in the Franconia area. Okay, this is actually my my uh, family, this is my, my dad is on the left and his siblings are on the right. Um, the three ladies that you see, they were all teachers. Uh, two of them taught in Fairfax County. One taught in the city of Alexandria. The gentleman you see behind them is, is my dad's brother. He actually was a teacher in Washington, DC. My dad on the left, um, was diagnosed early on as a child that he had a, a heart condition and they didn't expect him to live uh, beyond the age of about 14. Uh, so he did not go uh, beyond seventh grade at Laurel Grove School. And he, he ended up going out and finding a job and, and the job that he found was a job of um, being on a burial team at Arlington National Cemetery. And so he worked there for about 40 years. Once you graduated from Mall World School, the only uh, ed further education that you would have, you either had to go into the city of, of DC or uh, go out toward uh, the Manassas area. So the, the photo you see is the train station in Franconia where uh, my dad's four siblings actually took that train into DC to get their high school education. And that what you see there is a certificate, a uh, teacher's certificate for one of the, one of my aunts, Winnie Spencer, who um, taught in the, uh, in Fairfax County in the Vienna area. And that's uh, Winnie and Geneva, the two sisters, you could not, they could not get a master's degree in the state of Virginia. So they had to um, go to New York University in the summer uh, to get their master's degrees. And their brother Van got his master's degree in, uh, in DC. Uh, Winnie and Geneva, as I said, taught in Fairfax County. And this is a photo of Winnie with her class that she taught that this class was actually at the school on uh, what then was Fort Humphreys and is uh, today Fort Belvoir. So I know I know you said time is up. So um. I didn't want to stop you too. Much. It was so interesting. <laughs> um, tell us just very briefly. I'm gonna stop this. How can people? Where can people go to learn more about the Laurel Grove School Museum? Okay, um, our website is uh, laurelgroveschool.org, and. We're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 to 2, and we're located at uh, 6840 Beulah Street, Alexandria, Virginia. And you can just email us at contact at laurelgoldschool.org. I highly encourage everybody to visit. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Mr. Chase, I'm calling on you now. Um, can you give us a, 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 your background and then tell us about the evolution of the Gum Springs community specifically? Okay, um, I was born uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, my parents lived here at Gum Springs at the time, um, but um, I was born at Freedman's Hospital in, in Washington. Um, from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, as well as the graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University. 
it's interesting. I'm living, my parents built a, a home on my great uncle's property. It had probably changed hands a couple of times. However, um, um, it ended up with his, my father buying property that was once owned by my great uncle. Um, Dumb Springs, in regards to um, my being here and doing things here now, it, it sort of was a, a process of evolution. Uh, we saw the, the need at the community or the people uh, had been uh, asking for years uh, in regards to the county that uh, a museum should be developed. And um, in 1984, um, the, the county uh, sort of answered the request by developing a study with George Mason University on his call History Now. And they found from the completion of the study that um, by all means, the community uh, needed to have had a, a museum. So the Gum Springs Historical Society was formed back in, in 1984. And the community in regards to its origin, it was started by a gentleman by the name of West Ford, uh, who is said to be the son of George Washington by a slave. I'm going to pull up your, your PowerPoint so people can see his picture. Give me one second. There. Okay, and he, he purchased the land in 1833. And that in and of itself, a black man purchasing land in, in Virginia, that in and of itself was a, a miraculous thing. And so he, he purchased the land um, he, I think originally it was called uh, Willow Springs, and he called it, he changed the name to Gum Springs um, in regards to what uh, George Washington called it. George Washington used to refer to a location in Gum Springs. He'd tell people, I'll meet you at the Gum Springs, and referencing uh, a gum tree in a freshwater spring. So he has the community, he's allowing some people to, to live in the community as well. And by, by this uh, civil war, there are 13 families living in Gum Springs. And what is so unique about Gum Springs is that as these families migrated to Gum Springs, some of them were the freed slaves from the uh, Mount Vernon estate, some of them were runaway slaves. There was one that came uh, to Gum Springs by the name of Sam Taylor. He uh, came from Caroline County, Virginia, and he started the Bethlehem Baptist Church. And um, at early on, most of the people who lived in Gum Springs, they, they attended Alfred Street. But once uh, Reverend Taylor arrived, they started uh, having services in the homes of, of the people who lived in Gum Springs, and then they eventually uh, built an edifice in 1867 uh, at the close of the Civil War, and um, they, they built a structure. This, what you have up now, is the actual footprint of Gum Springs, it's a 214 acre tract of land. And um, West Ford had divided it into those four sections for his four children just before he died, which was in. Um, 1863, right when Sam Taylor was arriving in Gum Springs. And once again, um, I think what I want to emphasize is, is the ingenuity of the community in regards to how it evolved. Uh, this is Harriet Cottrell that you have up right now. And Harriet was a slave as a child, and she was on um, the River Farm Plantation of George Washington. She was a slave as a child, however, um, she died not too long after this picture was taken. Um, she actually um, dropped dead preparing um, breakfast for his, her children. So evidently, she looks pretty good here, but evidently the rigors, if you will, um, of slavery, uh, I guess no, there was no telling what all she had to endure, uh, but she, she just went, just expired one, one morning. Uh, but um, as I was saying, and these these are um, renderings of, of freedmen and freedmen and women that actually 
was taken from the ledger of uh, freedmen that came and uh, settled in Numbers Plains. And these are actual uh, renderings from the description of, of their accounts. But uh, um, what I was trying to um, get to in regards to the ingenuity of the community, um, Pam Taylor and his deacons, um, they formed this organization that they call the Joint Stock Club. And uh, that Joint Stock Club, they started purchasing land in Gum Springs and they purchased land along uh, what is now Fort Hunt Road. They purchased land what is now the um, George Washington Parkway. And they purchased the land and they resold it at cost, um, and which was quite a, a unique element. And you have all of these components that was making up this community. They, they were interested in, in building a community. And so they resold this property at cost. And then you had a situation whereby when Fort Humphrey was created, um, the government was not providing housing for the African-American soldiers. So um, Joe uh, King, he uh, created this little area uh, and built around, I guess around 20 little bungalows and, and provided housing for uh, the black soldier that was at, that was at uh, Fort Humphrey and Fort Belvoir. And un unfortunately, as time progressed, and I think a gentleman uh, referenced this area uh, a little early on in regards to the dilapidated housing. Um, uh, this place was vacated um, when West Forward's great, great, great grandson built Spring Garden Apartments. All of the people that were living in those apartments or in um, Bill King's Bottom moved to those apartments. And so this place was vacated. And then um, because of uh, this community action association, they, they were very, uh, took, they took upon themselves an opportunity. They said, listen, we need to provide additional affordable homes for African-Americans in this area. And so that, that vacated property, uh, they utilized it and, and marketed it as a means by which to go after funding. And there was a continuation, if you will, of this concept of providing housing for African-Americans in the area, affordable housing. And so you had one, two, you had three developments that, that evolved. You had the Joseph Maple Court development, whereby the people that lived there merged their properties uh, and struck a deal with the county and the federal government and built uh, Joseph Maple Court, and that's right off of Ports and Roads today. And then they also built the uh, affordable housing um, uh, off of Stars Bottom, not now called Napa Road. And then um, there's a somewhat of a, a problem in regards to the third one, which was the West Ford development. Um, that right now is Section 8 housing. And it was supposed to have been affordable housing for sale. And so that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to work with today in regards to with Fairfax County for them to make those homes available for sale. Because that was the agreement that was struck with those homeowners and, um, and the county and the federal government. And there was a... The, I, I, I want to reference the point that the ingenuity, once again, in regards to what this community did, providing housing and how they work towards building a community, it's, it's, it's utterly amazing. Dumb Springs had a school in 1850, had a school, was burned down. And then they had the Bethlehem Baptist Church served as church and school. Mr. And Chase, then, we are we are out of time. <laughs> are you? My alarm me? went off. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, final thoughts. I'm just getting started. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. Okay. Well, then uh, <laughs> I, I think I'll answer your question in regards to uh, what you asked um, 
Phyllis, and that is you, you can uh, visit and learn of that school, the Friedman School, the Rosenwald School that Gum Springs had, and, and also Drew Smith School, and then also the, 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 um, the development and how we went to the secondary element with Luther Jackson, Kenny Dean and Luther Jackson from the Gum Springs Museum, which is at 8100 Forson Road. It's on the west end of the Gum Springs Community Center. And uh, my hours are from um, uh, 10 to 5. Uh, but I'm here to 9 o'clock most of the time, so 9 o'clock at night. So even if you care to come in, I'll, I'll let you in. Thank so, you, Mr. Chase. Uh, I thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, for staying at the museum tonight, Mr. Chase, and uh, definitely encourage folks to go. And also, Gum Springs is in the news a lot lately, and we hope that by hearing this discussion, you're able to um, understand the context of the development challenges that are that they're facing right now. So, I'm going to pull call up the next panel, which is our final. Um, presentation panel. This is our call to action section. And um, we're facilitated by um, Alicia uh, Jones McLeod, who is the Director of Challenging Racism. And she's going to tell you a bit about um, the organization. And then we also have Carla Bruce joining us, who is the Chief um, Equity Officer for Fairfax County. And then um, we're super happy to have um, Reverend Kenneth Nixon, who is a staff organizer with the group that's called Voice, Virginia's organi Virginians Organized for Interfaith um, Community Engagement. And then we also have on this panel, Victor Powell, um, who is both the principal of Glasgow Middle School in uh, Fairfax County, as well as the head of the Northern Virginia Urban League, which is a really important um, position uh, working with youth in particular. Um, so please remember to send your questions and comments in through the Q&A button and we'll turn it over to you all. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alicia Jones McLeod. I am the Executive Director of Challenging Racism based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, it is our mission to empower individuals um, to disrupt racism one, um, compassionate conversation at a time. We lead facilitated, professionally facilitated discussions um, to discuss systemic racism um, in a safe and um, in a safe environment. But safe, I just want to say to you tonight, safe does not mean comfortable. Safe means that we can have it and not feel like we are being um, like like we're being attacked but it doesn't always mean that it's gonna be a comfortable conversation. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what I do and our website is um, www.challengingracism.org. So I'll put it in the chat, I'm sure before the night is over, but I wanna to get to these wonderful panelists. We have some great, great ideas and um, information here tonight. And I just wanna say, you know what I enjoyed is in the video when the woman, the teacher said that she was like, you know, they say, I always got to get along with people. And she was a rebel. And I want to welcome each one of you, Carla, Reverend Nixon, and Victor, to be a rebel with me tonight. So we're going to start with you guys doing a little introduction of um, who you are and what you bring to the table. And Carla, we're going to start with you. And you uh, feel free to share your slides. So I'm going to go to Carla, and then Reverend Nixon, and then um, Victor Powell, Brother Powell. Is that good? OK. So Carla, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Bruce, and as Alicia said, I'm the Chief Equity Officer for Fairfax County Government, and I am really proud of, um, um, given the history that has been discussed today. So, you know, I'll hop right in. I have a few slides, mainly for illustrative purposes. I am not planning to do a presentation, uh, but I just wanted to talk about my role as the Chief Equity Officer in Fairfax County and acknowledge really based on that history um, that we heard um, from Ms. Walker Ford and Mr. Chase and Dr. Oberly that there is an uneven opportunity landscape um, in Fairfax County. So while I would like to say that Fairfax County um, entered the work of advancing racial equity because we acknowledge this history, 
I think what we acknowledged was the impacts in our community today, right? And so we acknowledge the uneven opportunity landscape. So this slide is from a report that was done a couple of years ago by the um, Virginia Commonwealth University with support from the Northern Virginia Health Foundation. Um, and it identified these yellow areas. It was done not just for Fairfax County, it was done um, across the Northern Virginia region. And it identified these areas, um, it calls them islands of disadvantage. I'm very uncomfortable with that framing because what I know are that these areas are one, the homes of, uh, of very vibrant communities, but also that disadvantage is not the action of the people that live here. It is about the, the structural intentional actions of government in the private sector that really limited opportunity um, in these neighborhoods. If you remember the map uh, that Dr. Ober Oberly showed earlier, you'll notice that these islands of disadvantage line up very well with those historic African-American communities. So it was the you know, intentional separation from opportunity that um, I think produced these areas. Now, like I said, this is, um, you know, we're talking about the historic African-American community. And as Dr. Oberly showed, you know, that community um, has really remained fairly stagnant over the last 30 to 40 years. What we know though, is that that structure that was built with um, this sort of separation and segregation um, as its sort of driving factor is now really the home to many of the newcomers and immigrants to Fairfax County. So we're talking about um, you know, the historical impacts of racism, but also what they mean um, in our present day. And what that recognition um, spurred in the county was a commitment to advance racial and social equity in the adoption of our one Fairfax racial and social equity resolution and policy, which in a nutshell um, commits the county to consider equity in all of our planning and decision-making. That work though is in the appointment of me as the county's first chief equity officer um, back in June of 2018. That commitment though is based on a set of principles. It's about facing our history and it's acknowledging that we're not comfortable with this arrangement, right? The people who are at the county table today are not the same people that created those policies, but we're perpetuating them today. And if we don't take action based on our um, sort of what we want for the future and our knowledge about this history, then we can be held accountable. So are we, are we comfortable with the current social arrangement today? And if not, then we need to set what we want in the future and then work intently to change those dynamics, establish this as priority and make explicit choices, especially in an environment where there are competing choice, choices from a lot of different constituencies, many of which don't know this history and why this is uh, so important. And so, you know, part of my role is to, I'll say, challenge the county to make those bold and innovative commitments to address the historical wrongs and really position these communities, the individuals and the populations that have been harmed uh, by these past, past actions to have a focus or the opportunity to be successful moving forward. Very quickly, we follow the a model of normalizing, organizing and operationalizing toward a vision. And again, that vision is the vision of one Fairfax normalizing that the inequity, the, the acknowledgement that the inequity that we see today is driven by our history and is predictable by race. Organizing, meaning that we within government, we're acknowledging the role of uh, government in um, producing inequity and then organizing ourselves to do the work so that we can operationalize this commitment, make it more than just words, but turn it into action through policy and practice. I wanted to also just um, 
you know, sort of put out there this concept. We talk about equity a lot, and you probably have seen a version of this slide before. What I want to point out here is that our focus on equity is not about differences in people. What it's about is about dealing with an unjust system and structure. And so we acknowledge that, you know, that, that people and communities should be the center of this work, that our role in government is correcting the existing unjust system and structure. And that is a commitment across our whole organization, across every agency, every agency. While I um, am the chief equity officer, it's not just my work. I am working so that it's the work of every aspect of the county government at the highest levels of leadership, at the elected and executive level, but also embedded in um, the, the work of different departments, getting down to land use policy, getting down to um, helmet, health and human services policy, getting to public safety policy, getting to housing policy, and not just thinking of it in, a si in, in silos, but looking at how we are, our policy and pra practice are sort of strategically integrated to either continue to produce barriers or to lead to opportunity. But importantly, I want to sort of make the point in this, uh, Mr. Chase could tell you that just before this, um, this, uh, this meeting or this webinar, um, he and I had a conversation because I can do work on the out inside, but it has to be driven by the work that's happening on the outside. And it, that's how we come to understand how the doors of opportunity have been opened and closed to the population. It helps us in shaping the shared values. Because again, this is focusing on the folks who have been historically harmed, but it's also focused on the folks who see Fairfax as a great place to live, learn, work, and play, and want to maintain Fairfax as it is. And I think we all want to maintain Fairfax in, in, in its opportunity, but we want to acknowledge how that has been built, recognize how people have been separated from that opportunity, and position all people in Fairfax, again, one Fairfax, so that all people can have the opportunity uh, to thrive. And that's created not just by the county government, but by our partners in the community and other stakeholders like our development community, like our schools who are contributing to these outcomes. I think with that, I will, um, I see Alicia popping up. So I will end there and, and pass it off to the next panelist. Thank you, Carla. Reverend Nixon. Good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Kenneth Nixon, I'm an associate pastor at First Baptist Church of Manassas, and I'm recently a newly minted uh, associate organizer for Voice, which is Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement, which uh, TRS is a member of. And uh, I want to share briefly with you, uh, if I can share my screen here, all right. So VOICE, Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement is a nonpartisan citizens organization. And we have over 50 plus uh, faith and civic institutions that are throughout the Northern Virginia area. We most recently have expanded also into the Shenandoah uh, area of the state. And we have big bold plans to also expand into the Hampton Roads area. But what VOICE at its core is, is an organization that, as it says here, is, is looking to unite people across the lines of race, class, religion, and political party, uh, and take bold, big action on issues in our communities, including, but not limited to, immigration rights, criminal justice reform, affordable housing, as well as youth investment. Now, one of the things I wanna highlight here is the vision of voice, right? Voice believes that people working together have the power to change their communities and change their country for the better. It is through the work of, of the faith communities, particularly in uh, communities uh, uh, of color, where faith in the African-American community has been the bedrock of not only a source of, of strength and, and healing, but it's also been a bedrock of the civil rights movement. It's been the bedrock of any type of 
progress that has been needed in this country uh, relative to, to civil rights, voting rights, uh, affordable housing. Faith in the church and religious institutions have been the core of that. And through voice, um, we're able to bring together diverse uh, people of faith and institutions to work together to not only change the communities, but to change them for the better. The need, political and corporate leaders often don't embrace change unless they're pressured by the people they serve. Why that is important is because core to voice is two concepts, organized people and organized money. And you can't do one without the other. They have to go together. So voice organize the peoples through our institutions, through the communities. Uh, and then we organize money through, through raising funds uh, through our institutions, through our Friends of Voice campaign, so we can build the necessary power to force and create the space necessary to make changes in neighborhoods and communities through organizing. Our approach, we work with the people who want to transform the world from what it is to what they believe it sh uh, should be. We challenge people to imagine the change they can accomplish, connecting individuals to organizations to multiply their power and organize people by the hundreds and thousands to make their voices heard. We set bold goals, we create effective strategies and we act, taking on powerful interests that stand in the way. And what I wanna highlight is some of those things that, that we, we do in voice and we're still active and I'm the new organizer that's within Fairfax County. Uh, so I, I was glad to, to get a chance to listen to all the history. Uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with all of the panelists here to really pick their expertise and their brain to really help dig in and help move some of this stuff forward in Fairfax. But as you can see here, voice works on issues that originate from our our, our congregations, our synagogues, our mosques that come up and we, we fight for those issues that the community say that are necessary. And Prince William County, for example, was the only uh, county in the Commonwealth, which is the second largest county in uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, that is majority people of color, did not have a public defender's office. And Voice won and fought the creation of the Public Defender's Office in Prince William County to give more equitable outcomes to people of color and those who do not have effective representation. So as you can see here, I don't want to go through each one and take up too, too much of your time, but Voice in, in Fairfax County, in Arlington, and other areas in the Commonwealth, we are fighting for those who cannot fight for themselves, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's the expansion of, of kindergarten to serve low income children, uh, whether it's renovating local parks in, in African American and immigrant uh, communities in Southern Fairfax counties. Voice is an organization that is fighting to level the playing field and bring equity uh, and change into places uh, that, that creates lasting transformational change. Uh, and what I, I want you to just look at here is that when I mean we're a very diverse organization that is looking to bridge uh, the divide and bring everyone together, we have member institutions that span all of the geographic locations within Northern Virginia. And, and we work collectively to hold not only local elected officials accountable, we work to also uh, ensure that we're holding state officials accountable where possible. Uh, the main reason behind that is without making sure that we are doing the things necessary, whether it has to do with redlining or zoning or having to do with criminal justice reform, if we're just focus at the state level and not on the local communities, the boards of supervisors, the councils, the town councils, uh, we will not be effective in creating the lasting change that is necessary. And too often um, organizations focus on, only on the federal government or they focus on, on um, the state governments. But most yes. of the, the things that need to be done, particularly around zoning, 
is at that local board of supervisors, is at that city council. Uh, Keeping our communities accountable to the things that need to happen is that is exactly where we need to be. And we're going to get everyone fired up on this call to make mm-hmm. sure they're making that change in their local community. And I want to thank you for sharing. I want to move to Victor, but I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to talk more about being bold because both you and Carla mentioned that. And that's going to be that's going to be a question that we take in the Q&A. So thank you, Reverend Nixon. I'm going to um, um, go over to Victor now. Well, good evening. Good evening. I definitely want to say that it's, it's a blessing to be in the space. Um, I definitely will try to keep my comments brief because I definitely want to make sure that we get to the Q&A portion, which I'm sure people are eager for. Um, I cannot even introduce myself without giving um, honor to my parents, um, Linda Powell, um, who is from Birmingham, Alabama, um, and my father, William Powell, who grew up um, on the Dixie line of Kentucky and Indiana. Um, His family is from Holly Springs, Mississippi, and I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, So I I say all that because you need to understand, you know, who you're listening to and who you are talking to when we have these types of conversations. I'm currently the principal at Glasgow Middle School um, in Fairfax um, County. Um, We are the largest middle school in the state of Virginia. We have almost um, 1,900 students. Um, We have 180 staff members. Um, We are um, located in uh, Laconia. Um, I know a lot of people would say Alexandria, but uh, Laconia actually is the, the area where our school is. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that discussion later on as well. Um, there's a lot of history um, similar to what has already been shared um, with um, our area as well. Um, some of the other positions that I hold in the community, um, I'm currently the middle school rep for the state of Virginia um, for the associations for elementary and middle school principals for the state of Virginia. Um, and we report to the VDOE as far as policy and procedures. I'm also on the exec board for the Northern Virginia Urban League. I am not the president, as as was stated earlier. Um, I'm actually the secretary. Um, Dr. Letty Maxwell is our president um, of the local chapter for Northern Virginia Urban League. And I'm blessed and honored to to serve um, on that exec board as well. Um, Just a little bit about uh, Glasgow Middle School. Um, It was um, first started in 1960. Um, And so a lot of the history that was already articulated, I want to duplicate it, but it's some of the same things, you know, as far as in 1960, obviously a lot of our, our kids were being bused to Manassas. Um, so that 27 miles that was spoken to earlier in the video, um, and obviously the start of Luther Jackson in 54, where our kids were then, as far as African-American students were then bused to as far as Luther Jackson High School, which is now Luther Jackson Middle School. Um, now, I, I have to also articulate, because people probably drive by each and every day and don't realize it, uh, the Lincolnia uh, Senior Center um, was the original school for the white students at that time, which was the elementary school, which was Lincolnia Elementary School, um, which is over um, um, near our school by Glasgow Middle School as well. So just to kind of throw in a little bit of history with that as well. Um, our school demographics is extremely diverse and also inclusive. I think sometimes people say diversity, and to me, that's just being counting. We're more than just a diverse school, a very inclusive school as far as culture, background, Uh, language. We have about 55 different languages um, spoken at our school. Our our school is mostly Central, uh, students from Central and South um, America, Um, but we are definitely majority uh, Black and Brown. Um, We are not a Title I school, but very much close to it, almost 60 to 70 percent free and reduced lunch. Um, So we have a vast um, uh, diversity and plethora of students um, at at our school um, as well. As far as Fairfax, um, we definitely align ourselves to the vision within Um, Our chief equity officer um, that supports obviously a shared value of equity, you know, by expanding, you know, perspectives within our district, um, having courageous conversations with our staff, with our community, with our students, um, but also helping people to understand the differences and symptoms as far as some of the root causes um, that we are obviously going to get into and actually challenging the status quo of the policies that we have in place um, within FCPS, some of the practices that we have in place. Um, within FCPS and also some of the the core systems and beliefs um, within the culture of our communities and engaging our communities within that. Um, And then sure that for the purpose of all this is for our students, right? To make sure that we're unlocking that potential of every kid, not just some. Um, I have to, as as an educator, I have to to make sure we focus on, for me, the the pandemics of not just COVID-19, but also 1619, especially being in a state um, like Virginia, where a lot of this is is bubbling up, if you will, and has been for some time now, um, as it talks about, for me, the curriculum and what is taught and what is not taught. 
um, what is exposed to our students and what is not exposed, what trainings do our teachers get and what trainings um, do our teachers, you know, not have access to depending on um, the school or district um, or school board, uh, depending on what your, your stance is. Um, as far as policies and procedures that um, I feel like our state is uh, attempting to, to champion is around licensure, right? How are our teachers being trained before they even get into our schools around cultural competency? Um, and I believe the, the bills that were passed um, this past year were SB 1196 and HB 1904, I believe, um, that were centered around anti-racism, uh, culturally relevant, you know, teaching equity and anti-bias trainings for our teachers that are coming into the profession so that we have a pipeline of awareness for our, our staff um, that will be in front of our students. Um, but uh, for me, a lot of what we deal with in our schools specifically is really dealing with a lot of the economic challenges um, that are aligned to these same issues um, within the, the gaps and issues that we have within our schools. And like I said earlier, specifically within the curriculum, the holes, I would say Swiss cheese, um, that our SOLs or even Common Core um, has um, within uh, a lot of the, the structures that are in place. The conversations earlier were talking about housing. Um, for our students, obviously, we have zoning and lines that um, create where our kids are coming from that pipeline into our schools. And I definitely would like to underscore, you know, the text that were highlighted earlier um, around the color of law, but I also would throw out another text for people to read and to chew on as far as the faces at the bottom of the well, I think would also be a really good text for people to read. Um, I like the image that uh, the previous presenter kind of put up about equity. Um, I'm always tickled when I see those, those images, when you see, you know, students standing at the fence and then you have the different boxes. Um, but I also want to continue to challenge our staff and challenge our community to, to not just have students sitting on crates to see the game, but also to have a seat actually in the seats watching the game or actually having um, a, an opportunity to actually play in the game, right? How far are we willing to take this as far as pushing the envelope so that our students have access and opportunity across the board in our school? So I'll be brief with my yeah, comments yeah. to leave it at that. Thank you, Victor, because you definitely gave me that segue into what I was going to talk about with being bold, where I wanted to ask you guys to, to comment and share. Um, the, the point that I really wanted to make and to um, focus on was that you can have, I loved what you said about having a sense of belonging, um, a sense of inclusion. So it's not enough just for us to open the door, but we really do have to make sure that people feel comfortable when they come in. So I wanted to go to, um, Carla and ask, what is Fairfax County doing in order to make sure that we don't just have diversity, but we have a, we have a sense of belonging when we get that seat at the table? And um, meaning that in leadership, we are, you know, we have someone that looks like us, someone that, that understands our lived experience and we can talk to, but also in access, that we have access to the programs and the things that are going on. So how is Fairfax County um, working with making sure that our leadership is diverse and inclusive and our access is diverse and inclusive. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that one of the principles that we are following is the idea of um, targeted universalism. Um, it's a concept that um, has been defined by Professor John Powell out of the, now out of the University of, of California, Berkeley. And what it says is that you have goals, right? Broad goals for your community, broad goals for your organization, but you, you recognize where there might be gaps and, that, and, you, and you attribute those gaps to structural inequity. So it's our responsibility to do something. And then you apply targeted strategies to fill those gaps, right? To meet those gaps. So the same one size fits all policies, the same one size fits all practices don't work. You have to be targeted. So again, as I, in the graphic I shared earlier, this is happening across our whole organization. But you know, generally speaking, the philosophy that we're following is how are we doing now? Where are those gaps? And where can we apply targeted strategies to close those gaps? So you see that in the composition of our workforce. You see that in, um, in, in, in our programming and practices through different, through different agencies. I will say there is still a lot of work to do. So I'd never like to tell this, um, you know, paint the picture that we have made it. There is a lot of work to do, but that's our philosophy as we do this work. 
I just want to say, Carla, if you cured racism while we were on this call tonight, you would be getting a medal, maybe even a gold star. So we do, we all understand there's a lot of work to be done out there. Um, and I appreciate you being a partner in that work because there's a lot of it to go around. Um, I wanted to yeah, just echo being intentional is how we're going to get this done. So it's hard to do this if we're just trying to say, we just want it to be equitable. We can't wish it away. It has to be intentional work. And I wanted to take a moment and go to um, Reverend Nixon and ask about um, being intentional. That's the question that's in the chat here. So what issues um, are you and voice planning to tackle during the uh, coming year? So what are you being intentional about with mm -hmm. the anti-racism landscape? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one of the things that we're, <clears throat> two things that we're, we're focusing on uh, uh, has to do with uh, affordable housing. Uh, the second one is the decriminalization of mental illness and addiction. Uh, and within that, there are systemic institutional um, uh, racism that manifests itself everywhere, including the healthcare system. And one of the ways we are attacking that in Fairfax County and looking forward to that is uh, trying to get more, uh, more crisis receiving centers and crisis stabilization units within Fairfax County. We're actually in an active campaign now to get uh, one in Prince William County within, within the health region, but also throughout the entire Commonwealth uh, because mental illness and addiction uh, uh, go together. And it's, and it's a, a, a stigma, particularly in the black and brown communities that uh, do not get proper treatment nor seek it. And what often happens is these communities end up uh, in the local county jail uh, or a, 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 a strapped to an emergency room gurney, um, um, not getting a treatment, being in crisis, and now they now have a criminal record because we're criminalizing mental illness and addiction instead of putting it on a path to treatment. So VOICE is committed to an aggressive campaign uh, to get the Commonwealth, not only the governor, but the local um, boards and, and city councils to invest the resources necessary to transform the mental health system uh, particularly in black and brown uh, communities. So people are on the path to treatment and not uh, on the path to incarceration. Now, is this information on your website where people can get involved and support you in this? Yes, people can uh, go to voice-iaf.org uh, where they can uh, connect and, and see the issues that voice is focusing on. Uh, mental illness and addiction will be listed as well as supportable housing. But in particular in Fairfax, I will lift th this up um, uh, as the organizer in Fairfax. I'm, I'm embarking on a listening campaign to understand things on the, on the ground, um, but we're gonna be paying particular attention to the Gum Springs community, especially uh, that expansion project that will run right through that community. So Voice is gonna be active in partnering with that community as well. Thank you so much, Reverend Nixon. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that. I hope that you'll be able to share that link um, in the chat yeah. to everyone because we want people to be able to engage. Um, I wanted to go to um, Victor and then back to Carla to ask how people can get engaged and support you as well. So Victor, can you um, share ways that people can get engaged? I don't know what they can do at the school level, um, but I'm sure that there are ways that they can get involved and support. And then Carla, I'm gonna go to you to ask you the same question. Yeah, I would say there's a couple of different tiers that people can can get support um, to the schools or the school district. Um, a good end is really um, finding out what your where your passion is, what your interest is. So if it is in advocacy, you know, what does that look like to get involved and attend our school boards as far as specifically within the school board budget, um, as far as where the, the funds are being appropriated, right? As I said earlier, to me, this is very much economic, right? Where is the, the, the dollars and cents going? Um, if you have time, if you have resources, if you have community partnerships, schools are always looking to, to partner um, with local uh, community organizations um, within these specific areas, right? So that's definitely something that can be done. If you have the, 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 the clout or the level, you know, to take it to the state level, um, obviously your vote 
uh, matters. I looked in the, the, the question, people said, we just had an election. You know, there's a, there's a couple of different ways that people can, can get involved and make sure that their voice is heard. Obviously, people can even volunteer, right? What does that look like? I think for me, you know, that advocacy as far as policy, um, I'm really big on policy that um, our schools have in place, um, really examining the policies that we have that could be or possibly are perpetuating some of the inequities um, and it might not necessarily be a person, it could just be policies that we've had on the books and we haven't examined for a long time, but people are not looking and, and, and causing questions, you know, toward those things, because it, again, is, is keeping the status quo, if you will. I think also um, within the, your time and attention, um, obviously your resources, and to me, it's not just financial. Um, so that, that volunteering, that support definitely is very helpful for us. For, for, so for schools, it's partnership, it's advocacy, it's being, have, being, being able to have that voice at the school board level, but also at the school level as far as really just getting involved, especially if you are a quote unquote neighbor in that specific school uh, zoning area, you know that community, you're invested in that community and you have um, some historical perspective as well. So schools are always looking to partner um, either at that advocacy level for the district level or at the school based level. You know, I love that um, you guys are open to having people volunteer whatever their talents are um, to bring that to you. And also, I love what you said about um, people being able to look at the policies, not just the policies that are already passed, but the policies that are coming down the pipe. Because I will share with you, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is when people say, well, you know, I don't know where to start. I'm going to tell you, systemic racism didn't just happen. It wasn't a magic system that fell out from the sky on a, on a commandment or on a... Um, on any kind of you know tablet or anything like that. It was done by individuals. People sat there and they wrote those laws, they wrote those policies, they signed those bills, and that's how we got to where we are. So we need each one of you to dismantle it with us, to partner with us, to volunteer, to get involved, to advocate, because that's how we're going to change this. It's not magic, it's hard work. So I'm gonna go to Carla, because I know Carla is going to share something with us about how to get involved with maybe one Fairfax and some of the things that are going on um, and your initiative. So thank you, Carla. Yeah. So one very particular thing that you could do right now, I put in the chat. So the, um, our board of supervisors convened a task force to consider renaming Lee Highway and Lee Jackson Highway. That task force is currently meeting and they have put out a community survey. Um, a link to that survey is in the chat, and I would encourage you to um, answer the survey. I would encourage you to share that survey with your network. So that is one tangible thing that you can do. I would say more broadly, though, is participate in local government, right? So I think people are always looking for, you know, that hot, juicy thing that they can do. But, you know, what the, they're we are trying to advance a pro-equity policy agenda. And what is a pro-equity policy agenda? It's one that is, it's, it's the economy. It is it's economic development, it's housing, it's childcare. Um, you know, so the things that all of us would want in our community, we have to think about, are they accessible to everyone and participate in those ways? So. Um, you know, the, there is a One Fairfax um, webpage, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. But I'll tell you, it's fairly static. What's most important is thinking about the policies that are affecting people's lives and limiting opportunity, and that are his, that are rooted in structural racism and affecting change there. And that is available through the county's website. Take a look, participate, you know, pay attention to board meetings, be a part of board authorities and commissions, make your voice heard and say that you support a pro-equity policy agenda. There is no reason that people should not be involved. Like we, this is a call to action. So we are not gonna be shy about asking you, each and every person that's here, we have a yeah, hundred people listening to this right now. So a hundred people, if each one of you took one small step, that would be less that Alicia, Carl, Victor, and Reverend Nixon have to do, which is, which is helpful because there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of policies and there's a lot of systems. So if each one of us took a piece, we can get this done. You guys agree with me? This is not the, right. We're, we're in this. We're gonna, so we're asking you to do that. Um, and I'm going to 
because this has been a pleasure chatting with you. I, I could chat with you all night. Um, I'm going to close out this section for your Q&A. Um, ask you make sure that any links that you need to share, you share in the chat. And I'm gonna open it up for Q&A for all of our panelists, which we do have a number of things that we have touched on um, that other people have brought up earlier and that people have asked about in the chat. So don't go away though, because there might be some for you too. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to go first to my storyteller, um, Phyllis Walker Ford. So if Phyllis, can you come on camera with me? Hi. Hello, Phyllis. I wanted to, you know, there was a great question in the chat about you and your um, upbringing when you shared that um, you didn't fraternize with other um, African-American families. Um, most of the time. And if you knew that was unusual, um, and if so, how did you deal with that? Or if you thought that was just normal, what everybody had? Because, because of the distance between us in terms of, it was farmland. So I'm sitting with my family on 23 acres versus going about three miles to Carrolltown with 122 acres. And, and so we weren't walking back and forth to, to those places. So our socialization was at, was at church on Sunday. Excellent, thank you. Um, people really did, were touched by your experiences um, and the experiences that you guys shared and the video. Um, and also, also Ron, who got cut off. So I'm gonna run for, um, for a quick question because <laughs> I know Ron had more to tell us and I don't want to um, leave yes. him out. So thank you, Phyllis. I'm gonna to jump to Ron. Um, Reverend Nixon, I just wanna say, people are asking about membership and voice. So that might be something that we need to drop in the chat to make sure that they can join and be um, a part of what you are doing. Is Ron still here? Did he, did he leave us? Okay, oh, that's fine. Yeah, I think I think he must have uh, had a visitor at the museum. That's okay, because I think you know if I didn't live so far, I would drive there and go visit him myself. That looked that looked amazing, and everything that he talked about, I wanted to hear more about. Um, so Ron I Ron was to actually on. Ron was actually on site in the museum this evening, and uh, that is a county building that cl that closes at nine o'clock. So he may have have had to start closing down. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you um, conveying that because um, yeah, we wanna hear from him, but I understand that he has things that he has to do in that building as well. Um, so I wanted to ask, and you know what? I will give this to um, Carla and Reverend Nixon and Victor to answer this question. Um, someone asked about the Lutheran church um, and basically diversifying the church, how can they, what can they do to start with the DEI issues? But I'm gonna open that up and say, there are a lot of really white spaces um, in Fairfax County. So if you are in one of those spaces as a white person, what could you look at in order to start tackling some of these DEI issues? Some of the, you wanna invite people in, right? You wanna share with them. So what, um, what can they do to help diversify and then maybe even bring some equity to the to their section and then some inclusion. Wouldn't that be lovely? And then we can get some belonging. We get some belonging where people act like I'm supposed to be there. So what would you suggest as a first step if you're a white person in a white space that wants to bring or invite more people in and make them feel at home? So let's start with Carla and then I'll go to Reverend Nixon and I'll go to um, Brother Powell. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that I, am the best person to address this, but I think one of the things is to ask, are you comfortable with that arrangement? Is that, is that what you want? Um, and, and if you see it as a pro problem. Now, again, you know, one of the things, and I don't want to um, sort of disregard that question, and maybe, again, maybe somebody else might um, um, have some specific strategies. What I will say is that you can still be involved in DEI work. You don't have to have 
people of color present, right? You can still, you can still begin to act. Um, now, in terms of, again, diversifying your space, the other thing that I would point out, which again, is I'm not sure that it would um, align exactly with what the intent of the question was, is to recognize that you can't force that. You know, people are, are, are organized in the way that, in, in ways that they also want to be organized. And so trying to force a social arrangement that is not the desire of the community that you have you know, observe is not present is also something to be comfortable with. In some cases, people do not want to be a part of. So as much as you also want to encourage, you also have to be prepared that there might not be interest and that is okay too. So I think that that's something people get, you know, are uncomfortable with and try and sort of force something that may not be the, what is desired by the actual people that they are trying to attract. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Because that is, that is some true words. That's some true words that sometimes people just don't want to be there with you. Um, but there are always systems that you can tackle and there are barriers that you can overcome or break down so that if there are people in the community that want to be there with you, um, it's not hard for them to get involved. Um, Reverend Nixon, um, did you have anything to add? The one thing, thing I would add if someone is looking for somewhere to start is to embark on, on a listening campaign. It can be with your neighbors, it could be within your own family, but, but listen, actively listen and kind of try to get to the core um, issues of, of what people are thinking and they're feeling because most people won't um, be comfortable moving to a place particularly if they, there's no relationship there until they know you care. So the mm -hmm. first step is to actually listen and to get an understanding of, of who they are, where their lived and learned experience is coming from, and what is driving their worldview and for them to act. And then once you understand that, then you'll be able to get to the place where you will be able to effectively understand how to navigate that. Thank you, Reverend Nixon. That is also very important. Listening is probably the most important skill you can have in this work. Um, so I appreciate you for emphasizing that. And um, Brother Powell, would you like to share? Yes, most definitely. I think I'll definitely concur off everything that my, my colleagues and panelists have said, um, especially as it pertains to the relationship building um, and that self-examination, You know, whether you're coming at it from a biblical standpoint, as far as examining your life, um, from scripture, or if you're coming at it from, you know, the unexamined life is not a life worth living. However you choose to, to come at that, you know, to me, you got to kind of start there. And that for me helps people kind of formalize what is their why? Why are we doing this service, right? I would hope that, again, based off the, the institution that is from a, a scriptural or biblical or faith-based um, um, perspective or um, foundation, if you will. But I think also to me, especially kind of coming from my own Christian perspective, hospitality is key, right? Um, you can have people in your space, but do they feel welcome, right? Is it a welcome space when they get there? You can bring a hundred and whoever people there, but do they want to stay? Is it a place where they feel mm -hmm. like they can be invested? So is it a place where people can like live in community with one another? And especially within our faith, I think what does that reconciliation work look like? Um, and that healing um, to me must be a part of that work, right? Um, and a part of that is you have to be honest. You have to be truth telling um, within that as far as kind of where you are. So to me, that kind of goes back to the self-examination piece. So that's my two cents to it. I have one more point to that. I would say be careful of the slippery slope of charity. Um, I think charity is important, but I think charity sometimes can create um, a power imbalance. And mm -hmm. uh, people sometimes recognize need in the community and want to act and inadvertently um, in trying to connect to others in the population, uh, create a power imbalance um, and a focus more on what they desire to gain versus the building up and the lifting up of the community that they um, would like to serve. And so um, I would also offer that because I know that that's often a mechanism that's used to attract a more diverse population. 
And I just wanted to say that each one of our panelists, everyone that's on the screen right now and more have shared resources with you. Share them, share the link to this recording, share, go to one of the sites, take a friend, take someone with you, visit, go and have conversations. Our, our panelists are local. Like these people are local and they are presenting. We have a couple of events that popped up in the chat. Um, I know one from Voice. I, there are things going on where you can be involved. No one is saying that this has to happen. It's not gonna happen overnight, but every single step that you take is another step toward us being equitable. I know Jeff shared that their videos, the full length videos are available. Um, George shared a number of books that um, we can see and a bunch of different resources, uh, websites at the end where we can go and visit and learn more. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work that we can do um, without, book, well, let me not say without, there's a lot of work that can be done by people that are in white spaces before they even like before they even are um, inviting people in. There's self work that you need to do. There's self reflection that needs to be done, and there's learning that needs to happen. Because there's nothing worse than inviting me in and then asking me to explain blackness to you. I don't want to be a part of that conversation. I don't know if anyone else does, but that is not my thing. So I want to be inclusive. I want to be, I want to belong. I want to share your space, but I don't want to have to explain to you my entire history and why you can't touch my hair. So I just wanted to leave you with that. I'm going to go and turn this over. I want to thank each and every one of our panelists because it has been a pleasure chatting with you and hearing from each one of you tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it back over for the closeout, but thank you so much for everything that you shared with us tonight, all of your insight. So, um, wow, that was really very powerful and meaningful. Thank you. Thank you to Alicia and thank you to all of you for sharing. Um, I have a lot of notes and a lot of suggestions. I put a link in the chat for folks to um, give us feedback for those of you in the audience. I really would like to hear what your thoughts are about um, where you, what you wanna do, what you're doing, what you wanna do, what you need to know more about to be able to be engaging in a meaning, meaningful substantive way um, on this important topic. But um, uh, I, I really wanna say that we've been just incredibly moved by the interest in this program um, for those of you who are attending and particularly for the incredible generosity that um, about hundred people from around Northern Virginia have have shared their time and their their and and have helped us understand what are resources we should be looking at and have talked to us about race and racism and what it means for them and um, what they would like for us to do to to help other people um, be active in in tackling this. So um, I want to say that you'll be getting follow up uh, resources from us. You'll be getting links to the recordings. And for those of you who are members of Temple Road of Shalom, I really encourage you to look at the calendar, the schedule, and sign up for the programs that uh, we are, that the, the, the temple is putting together for us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Sachs, who's going to close us out. Thanks, Julie. Um, incredibly moved by today's session and by all all three of this whole series you know alicia you just said you know so rightly you know i don't want to have to explain to you uh you know what what it is uh to 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 be black um and yet you and all of the panelists have spent so much time with us and opened up to us and you have uh given us the generosity of teaching us so much um so thank you for doing that and, uh, and I also want to thank the leaders who have put together this series. Um, you know, I, I really think the part of the wisdom of this wonderful series on understanding racism is that uh, we, we, we learned and, and, and we were hopefully inspired and motivated to action. Um, we really, we listened and, and then now we have to act. Um, you know, I'll, I'll remind everyone, you know, we've been talking about scripture and what we learned from it that the Talmud teaches us, um, first of all, you know, we think of, of Judaism as a, as, a, as a religion of the book, right? That we, we do learn. Um, we also think of Judaism as a religion of action. 
And the Talmud teaches us that one whose, whose deeds, whose, one whose learning outnumbers his or her deeds is like, a, is like a tree that has a lot of branches, but not deep enough roots. And, and wind will come along and blow, blow us away. But one whose deeds outnumber his or her uh, acts of learning, uh, one who actually acts in the world is one whose branches might be few, but whose roots are deep and strong. And that's what we seek to do as a community. And that's how we seek to strengthen the community around us of, of Northern Virginia and, and the world around us. So let's take what we've learned, uh, continue to, to learn and reflect um, as we were just charged to do, you know, sign up for the dialogues on race and equity. Um, and, uh, and, and also figure out what you want to do. Let's be active in voice. Somebody asked about membership. We are members. We at Temple Road of Shalom are members of voice. If you want to get involved, let me know. Um, reach out. If you want to talk about partnering with a school, as was mentioned, uh, give, give me a call and let's talk about it. Um, reach out to, to Hillary Horn or Aly Alyssa Prince, our social action co-chairs. Um, be active in county government as we were called upon to do. Let's get out there and, and do something uh, and um, really um, honor the, the learning that we've done. So uh, that's it. I'm just going to thank everyone for attending and thank our leaders for teaching us and for uh, running this wonderful program. Good night.